any questions can you move on okay good let's move on to the next slide i have uh, close to 14 slides so i think uh, with the time that we are going i am probably going into a lot of detail uh, while it is useful for all of us uh, i'm not sure if we need to spend that amount of time so i will again attempt to brush through a little bit faster uh, the only risk I have is if I go through faster, probably you may not be able to get the essence of what I'm trying to say. So, but but let's try it and see. So with more and more uh, exposure to what's happening in our organization today, uh, and with a lot of history that we have seen in the last 20 years, uh, I don't need to probably tell you some of those, but just to refer here for us to understand what we're talking about, whether it is Enron, whether it is uh, other uh, frauds or uh, misrepresentation or uh, vested interest playing bigger role in uh, uh, some of the corporations not truly sticking to their uh, core principles. There has been a larger need for governance and this corporate governance has become an extremely important element. Today organizations have separate functions, separate departments, separate qualified experienced people with a team of uh, I would say experts sitting and looking at uh, how can we better represent ourselves to the outside world in terms of what are we doing? How do we bring the credibility? How we how do we bring in uh, an element of respect so that our investors, our employees, the society, and everybody else understands what we are doing and why we are doing? And for us to do that, we need to definitely do certain things. So without getting into the detail, I think uh, with Sorbens actually Act coming into 2002 post Enron, uh, I think there has been a lot of focus from organizations, top brass, to focus on uh, corporate social responsibility as well as corporate governance. Uh, the governance is more in terms of being transparent, visible, uh, in order to you know, basically be very explicit, uh, to state what needs to be stated, to clearly have disclaimers of you know, what you believe People should not misinterpret. And if you t if you see the annual reports today, I mean, those days I think when I grew up, uh, the annual reports used to be a few pages, maybe 25, 30 pages. Today it runs beyond 100 pages. A lot of these beyond uh, the routine items like the plans, the strategies, the the progress made, both text as well as financials and other uh, narratives to what is happening in the company there's a lot of focus on also telling people information that they need to know it's not that they like to know they need to know and today if you want to invest as an individual into a share market uh, for a, any particular listed company today if you want to buy even a product as a customer even if you have to buy a product for as less as 20 rupees or as high as 1 lakh rupees i think the customer today definitely wants to know how things are done. What kind of company is this? What is the record they have? Have they done something that is unethical? Have they been indulging in practices that are uh, impacting a section of society or impacting a group of, uh, I would say, countries which are impoverished? Or are they doing something that is affecting the environment today? And so many other things. So today, right from seeing uh, you know, different, different information on the label of any product. Sometimes you wonder why they are telling you all these things. Because in the past, sometimes you never bothered to look at them. Two, declaring all this in an annual report, stating about it, doing a lot of campaigns on uh, corporate social responsibility, trying to extend support to the society from where they're drawing people, they're drawing resources, they're, they're taking land and, uh, you know, uh, facilities. And, and so many different things. They, they definitely feel there is a need for them to bring in credibility. And there's a lot of discussion on this topic in the last 20 years about if business is for profit, it is only that that they have to focus on, on, on. By getting into corporate governance, by spending money on corporate social responsibility, by trying to focus too much of effort and attention towards all the non-business areas, somewhere the stakeholders or the shareholders' interest are compromise so if i'm a shareholder i've invested money in the company and i want good returns i want returns that 
will help me grow my wealth will help me reinvest again or probably refer more people to invest again and as and more as more and more investments a company gets provided they have the right direction and strategy it's always going to be useful for them to successfully uh, gain a bit better market share but if you look at the converse side of it if i'm a shareholder and i see my company spending 20% of the money efforts uh, attention focus purely to do things which are not the reason why i put the money right the question deeply comes out saying why are you doing all this what is the purpose of doing all this so this there's a lot of debate on this topic i mean it's not about what is right or wrong it's all about what are you truly trying to do when you run a company and that is where i think different companies have different stands and some people explicitly say some people do a lot of things but do not state it so much because they feel it is not required end of the day it is important for every organization to definitely focus on this and it is happening today it is happening today if it is about blind foundation if it is about uh, health related which is prevent prevention of epidemics if it is about environmental uh, uh, topics if it is about uh, anything else you will always see an organization or a brand trying to make the best possible opportunity to market themselves so you take the the marathons the runs the campaigns the blood uh, donation camps so many other things you see somewhere or the other you see some organization trying to of course support a good initiative but as a by product by virtue of doing that also earn a few credibility points in terms of the society on the whole so long debate but interestingly this is uh, something that uh, is happening more and more uh, i think i would even say today a lot of good things are happening only because companies are getting involved and you also see that in uh, though not exactly related to the csr concept but in sports as well right if you see the isl today football 20 years back or even 10 years back was unknown of i mean the whole country is cricket crazy football probably happens once in 4 years when all of us go and support a country that we have no idea about purely because we like a few players we've seen a few of them on the video or tv today we have players that are playing the soccer league today we have companies who are sponsoring them today i see we are making some footprint in in the global stage looking at it i see that we will definitely be at least in the qualifying round of the world cup in the next maybe 8 or 12 years somewhere we will be in the top 50 probably in the next 10 or 12 years which is a big sign a big different sign than what we had in the past so somewhere the corporates have been involved in so many things of course for money no doubt by investing in ipl and isl they are doing charity we all know that it is business of business and business of sports there is no doubt about it but i think somewhere because of the because of the influence and the cloud they have uh, i would see that the good side of the whole uh, investment is about promoting certain very important sports that never been highlighted in the past unfortunately after so many years of being free so let's moving on to the next uh, topic uh, next slide i mean again uh, will not get into detail but uh, any questions so far we are almost towards the end of the first hour and uh, possibly i have tried to cover things that we know we understand we've seen we are able to relate to uh, academically there is a structure in which we are going through definitions which we will do when we actually get into e1 but today we are talking only about do i really understand little bit about uh, you know enterprise organizations the global context what is happening in different cultures where technology is playing a role where am i uh, placed here am i obsolete am i relevant am i up to date am i really uh, you know outdated and so on okay can i be more on <coughs> okay so quickly moving on uh, we will quickly cover now the different functions and uh, i'm assuming that some of you are working so can i have a quick uh, show of hands in terms of how many people are actually working right now all doing business versus purely being a student so for me to probably uh, use my examples differently for you to be useful can you tell me working or student
Wonderful. Good. So I, I hope so far the examples or the uh, instances or some uh, references probably helped you a little bit because I see at least two of the three are working. So let's move on to that. So uh, the good news is that I don't have to spend too much of energy because you kind of know these functions, but I'll quickly touch upon each of these functions. So uh, typically these functions are having certain objectives in mind. And uh, in finance, we talk about finance. Uh, finance guys usually are the most hated people in the organization. I am a finance guy myself. So you can imagine uh, someone like me or somebody doing a role of mine uh, traditionally who believes that he owns or because he's the custodian of what's happening that regards with regards to money in the organization. So whether it is disbursing cash, paying salaries, you know, buying equipments, uh, paying money to put up a new office. The finance guys typically, traditionally, I would say, are the people who are the most important people, or at least they seem themselves to be more important. Traditionally, it's always been the case that uh, this function is normally at the end of everything that happens. So, I mean, a lot of thoughts are put together to start something, buy something, and so on. And then finance comes in somewhere in the middle or towards the end and says, we have needed a budget, we need approval. You know, we need to get some quotations. We need to ensure that we have adequate due diligence of, you know, who we are buying from. Is it credible? Are there good organizations? Are they providing warranty and all that I mean, stuff? So finance typically has financial accounting, management accounting, treasury, working capital, a lot of other functions. So I would broadly, broadly put finance into three major areas. One is financial accounting, which to me is like the three key functions of human life food, clothing, shelter. So you, you, you need to have food, you need to have clothing, you need to have shelter so that you're able to survive a basic decent life. Now, it is extremely important, but at the same time, it is not the end of everything as we know. So that's why we have something called, I would say, management accounting. And where somewhere management accounting, treasury, working capital go together because it's about managing funds, it's about managing uh, information it is about managing and reporting and providing visibility of what's happening because it's important if you take the example of going from delhi to nagpur if you don't know where you are if you do not know how many kilometers you have to cover i mean probably you will run out of fuel you run out of energy you don't know if you are getting into a dark part of the day where you need to find an accommodation or find something to eat and so on many other things so you need to always do a stage correction or a stage review so that's what normally happens. I'm, I'm trying to put it very simple. Uh, I mean, probably there is a lot of definitive explanations to it, but in simple terms, it's all about, are we able to manage, are we able to monitor progressively, look at what's happening? Do we have adequate information about funds? Do we know what is coming in? Do we have enough money collected from the customers? What are the payment uh, obligations do we have? Who do we need to pay? When? What is the impact to the business? So can we pay somebody late? Can we play employees early or late? Can we play a vendor late or early? So many other decisions. Now, financial accounting and management accounting somewhere works closely as well. The only difference is that management accounting starts and treasury accounting runs parallel to financial accounting. And uh, it's more of analysis. It's more of looking at the outside world, the customer, looking at how are you placed in terms of your cost structure, how are you placed in terms of your revenue streams, are we able to give a sales guy or a marketing guy a, a visibility about where the orders are coming from, which customers are paying well, which products or services are giving you good margin because you have so much of wealth of information as a finance guy that you can actually define what needs to be done next. It's a different story that some may not be practical, some are purely a Microsoft Excel exercise, not something that can run in the market. However, it's important that the information or data we have can be utilized so well for the benefit of the organization. This last segment primarily looks at audit, compliance, governance, looks at secretarial startups, you know, incorporation, maintenance, statutory requirements, a lot of outside world inside company activities which are required for maintaining the hygiene of it. So if I take an example of the foot clothing center for financial accounting, I would take an example of management accounting to be more of the enhancement side of it. 
whether you are qualified, whether you have a good health, whether you have a, a decent a qualification, do you have a happy life and so on. And all these compliance audit relations are more fundamental or more, I would say, while the food clothing shelter are required for you to survive, the, the audit and the compliance are the very purpose of why you are here. So, so it's about we as a person, the purpose of we. So if you are not there, if certain basic things are not taken care, I mean, you do not exist as a human being, you don't exist as a company. So governments today, as I said, when I was talking about uh, governance and CSR and corporate governance, governments today, society, societies today are looking very keenly about each organization today. In fact, there are so many guidelines, I won't say restrictions, but guidelines to start any business, any part of the world, only to make sure that certain adverse or negative impact do not happen once the business starts. This was never the case in the past because it was when somebody thought that they could make more money or sell better products or tap better manpower that they would start anywhere anything. So typically that's primarily what happens in finance function. Now, interestingly, going on to the next uh, uh, slide, it has a very strong correlation to finance function. It talks about typically how transformation is happening today. Now, when we talk about finance, the finance that we know of, the finance that we are aware of. Just a minute. Sorry. So the finance that we are aware of, the way it is traditionally done, has undergone changes. So today we have this uh, very interesting term called fintech. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, these are companies, these are concepts which are now developed as products by companies where finance is looked at differently. Uh, the way the finance functions operate with a customer or supplier or even within the organization is different. A lot of focus on automation, a lot of focus on trying to understand the source of information and also trying to understand what the output of any activity should be. So today, uh, finance teams or finance departments are always sitting with tons of data. Uh, while they mostly have finance data, they also have operational data. They also have data on, uh, I would say, marketing, sales, no, do not directly. And what is happening is that in the next big revolution that is happening. So if I quickly go back and interestingly give you an anecdote of uh, what it's been always about in, in, the, in the past, I think uh, the whole of 80s, 70s, 80s and 90s, one of the most important crucial elements that the whole world was revolving around was oil. And uh, right from wars to governments to policies to economic strength to organizations flourishing uh, in a particular country which is oil rich used to be based on the source of oil. Now, the next oil is data. If you look at the last 10 years, and if you look at what Google says, Google clearly says that, I mean, their primary mission is to organize world's information and make it available to all. In the last 10 years, as per what Google says, the amount of information that has been collected or created, not collected, created would be the right word, has not happened in the last 2000 years. So between the early 2000 and today, or maybe mid 2000 and today, what Google holds as data or database or big data, the way we see it, has been created in 10 years, in 10, 12 years. And that sums up the entire humanity versus what we must have created in 2000 plus years of uh, human existence. So data is the most important thing. The forces for outsourcing and offshoring are pretty much started with finance. Uh, there was always offshoring of other functions or other industries. See, when we talk about BPO, people think BPOs came in the early 2000s or late 90s. But if you look at it, the fundamental concepts of BPO, which is economies of scale, low cost labor, and centralized manufacturing or production or activity was always there in even the 70s and 80s. If you look at a lot of the companies in the world that had plants outside their home country was also a benefit towards these three. If you take any company, if you take if you take the, the, the automobile companies in the world, if you take the electronic manufacturing companies in the world, 
if you take the apparel industry in the world nike manufactured all their products 20 30 years back in countries like uh, africa bangladesh india and so on maybe they didn't have their own shop maybe they were subcontracting or job work kind of a role where they basically gave it to somebody from who they basically took it up assembled quality checked whatever whatever and then they basically branded them as their products based on successful completion of the quality standards so typically this is not something very new that we are seeing it is just happening in areas other than manufacturing which is where we're talking about business process but the fundamental concepts of what works in an offshoring uh, world has been there for at least a good 50 60 years today a good 50 60 years i would say right after the world war 2 in the 60s and 70s so moving on to uh, the transformation piece of uh, finance going to technology so technology plays a role today we talked about artificial intelligence we talked about machine learning we talked about uh, internet of things we're talking about uh, strong correlation between te- different technology elements it is happening more and more so in the olden days it or technology was a very small team of people you know where they basically store information and give it to you when you need it today we live with it we we live with everything that happens in it uh, in fact it is one of the most important drivers for organization today it is not good that you have a good customer base it is not good that you have a good segment of customers who see your product to be a niche it is important that you are in line with what a customer wants a classic example again today is this particular medium that we are going through had like any other company if saraf said that i would probably do only face to face classes if people need to go they can go to my nearest center and you know we have same uh, level of uh, faculties and quality of content and so on there are a lot of areas where people would prefer an online medium so it's important whether you have a unique customer uh, product or service it's important to have but i'm saying that it is not the only thing you need to have the platform and the technology to be able to attract people who look at that as the most important factor today it's not important that you are able to now log into a computer or to amazon or a flipkart and order people prefer an application on their mobile which helps them track which helps them order while they are going they don't need a computer or laptop anymore so everything around uh, technology has become so competitive today that that is the single most important factor for organizations to survive so again in terms of it we're talking about information technology network systems information systems which is basically about how you collect identify collect centralize share disseminate or interpret information uh, again we're talking about implementation of various systems erps we're talking about sap oracle we're talking about cloud based system so all the traditional erps or enterprise resource planning systems which basically helped real time collection of data and reporting of data so that all departments in an organization right from material planning to production to finance to marketing to supply chain are able to basically look at what's happening in the production line real time in front of their computer now the whole technology is moving from a server based to a cloud based today and there is no single organization in the it space who is behind this every organization right from sap and oracle and any other organizations are indeed looking at how to use this technology for their customers and for their potential customers as well who would be looking at this as an important factor so moving on so uh, quickly into the next slide from technology the information systems or the information uh, powerhouse in terms of having a lot of these things uh, is required today through various tools so i mean we 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 are in a world where we have seen all this i think examples will be more easier for us than anybody else who must have uh, looked at it in the past so we talked about cloud computing we talked about e business a business sitting in front of an internet connected a uh, handheld or computer literally uh, talking to customers ordering uh, items uh, looking at a at a complaint or uh, monitoring a performance 
anything anything for that matter increasingly important has been the crm as well the customer relationship management where we are basically looking at tapping the customer life cycle looking at what typically happens in a customer life cycle so how does a customer enter into an organization what are his preferences how many of us must have for some reason in the past thought that i would only go for this product for example i am a hardcore sony fan i know sony is not doing so well today but i am very very hesitant to move away from a sony product today simple reason is it has an aspirational or a intrinsic value for me because the first product i bought 20 years back was a sony product and i always felt that whatever products that sony sells is always has good quality even if they may be a little more pricey so in with the advent of samsung when in electronics or lg in household lighting articles or in their any other uh, brands i have stuck to sony as much as possible now the flip side of it is there are a lot of companies who are losing ground right but then there is an affinity that we have and there is a reason why we have the affinity and it becomes very difficult for us to move away from that so typically a customer chooses a brand for various reasons maybe he bought it when you know he got his first job maybe he bought it when he got married maybe he got bought it when probably he got a promotion and so on i'm sorry i'm i'm giving a man example if you take a woman probably when uh, she went for her education uh, on her own in the pa- in the in a foreign country where she w- brought a first product so there are different stages in human lives the there we where we look at products where we associate themselves with and that's why it's important to look at customer relationship management and that is where i'm saying that technology sometimes plays a role which is a little difficult because technology keeps you away you have a problem with a bank you are not happy with a particular service i can guarantee it will take at least 30 minutes before you talk to somebody from a bank and those 30 minutes you literally have to pray to god that the call doesn't drop the menu doesn't change your phone supports whatever the bank uh, interactive voice recording system is asking for and so on and so forth so once upon a time in an interview with uh, with a group of journalists uh, close to 10 years back i think uh, richard branson as you may know him as the head of the virgin group a very interesting story if you look at what he did and how he came up uh, with the company that he is today he made a very clear statement that i am talking about early 2000 when technology was becoming the most important factor for doing business he made a very interesting statement that a companies for companies uh, technology should not come between an organization and a customer it is only good if it is an enabler the moment it is in between it is a barrier that is a day when the customers will stop or possibly consider technology to be a differentiating factor to go into a particular service <laughs> and this statement is very true even today as as i mentioned to you if you have to reach somebody in a bank or uh, or some other uh, company you need to probably wait for a few minutes or sometimes an hour to get the right person and still not sure whether the person will be able to help you with whatever your requirements are so moving on to operations again we are looking at operations purely from a manufacturing or production related activity uh, operations again is basically inputs process outputs you have certain inputs you perform certain activities uh, then there is a product which is in progress and there is a finished goods and then you sell it or store it and then eventually the customer consumes it or uses it now of course porter had defined the value chain he called certain activities are primary and secondary second activities are secondary but fundamentally porter also reinforces the fact that every step in the value chain is only useful if it adds value so when you say value what is value value is all about i buy a product for a cost x correct and the customer who is consuming it should see a value or a benefit from the product x we know a product x can perform certain functions but that does not necessarily make it a value addition the value addition is only when customer pays for a product x but gets something x plus something in return so it could be a feature it could be a service it could be a freebie at the time of purchase it could be a added equipment or a accessory so if you go in for a phone probably they'll give you a, a, a maybe a, a pen drive maybe something else so 
value chain is important because what differentiates companies is today the value and it is perceived differently for different people it doesn't have to be always a additional product or a service it can be something that that the company has marketed saying this will enhance the experience of a customer it will help so for example if you if you take a product if you take a phone for example there are phones where people now can log in using face recognition a few maybe a couple of years back fingerprint a few years back maybe a pattern or a pin number a few years back simply a hard press of the star or the asterisk so whether a customer looks at that as a value is purely with the customer so if you get the new phone that is coming in uh, i'm sure you must have seen the ad of uh, one plus 60 i don't know what it is it seems coming sometime in this month it talks about unlocking the phone very differently now some of us may not see it as a value some of us may see it as how does it make a difference if i lock it this way or that way is it something that i truly want am i ready to pay a premium for it am i am i need to buy or change a phone just because i have certain functions that are very unique is purely a decision that is taken by a customer and uh, sometimes companies go wrong what they think is value addition what they think are unique features may not be perceived that way so that is why you see some companies despite doing a lot of these finally does not find them so relevant so it's important when you try and introduce something into a product you are able to also assess the market and the customer to see whether it is something that the customers really want okay so moving on to from operations into the next one which is uh, the tools technique so again operations management is all about uh, a series of tasks act activities through a system through a platform that has lot of constraints what is a constraint a constraint is a typical economics uh, i would say parlance of limited means unlimited wants so you have certain constraints you have certain restrictions or limitations but you need to still achieve certain important objectives so in operations it is always about managing your constraints managing your resources managing your uh, money or time or skill i mean everything is limited or reasonably limited it's not unlimited for sure and typically in operations management it's all about planning and managing planning monitoring management assessing how things work what doesn't work well constantly looking at what needs to change constantly observing the feedback from the production floor from the customer from the guys who are talking to the customer the marketing or the sales guys and so many other people and it is also about understanding what can go wrong it's also about understanding the way you are layout you are understanding the way you are organized whether it, you know for a particular type of manufacturing you need to be outside the city in the city whether you need to in a production floor fully air conditioned or not whether a particular equipment needs air condition or not whether a particular product needs to be stored in the cold storage there are so many other thoughts i mean uh, areas that we need to look at in a capacity or production management and when is operations management also about production management marketing management it's all about how you complete your operations from the time you get the input and the time you get get the output out so people in the operations team typically are people you know we 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 use the word operations in close connection to how a war is fought so typically in the during the second world war this term operations came from how strategies are developed during a war while you have a certain game plan you know that you know you will uh, have so many number of people guarding or uh, you know put up in a particular location you will wait for certain triggers to fire or to defend you will possibly have a, an option or a choice of instruction that could come from the top from your leader whoever the leader is and so many having said that it is very difficult to predict what could actually happen so you always have you are always at the point of taking decisions depending on what happens around you and what you have and if you if you see some of the war movies i mean an excellent example of how they overcome different situations when they anticipate something and something else happen and then you see that they quickly you know change their course they 
they reduce people increase people divert people add more people they decide not to go for a offensive uh, and they sometimes hide so many other things so in in modern day corporate world operations is all about the constraints the limitations the resources that you have which are primarily not limitless and how you work around it how you make sure you get the best of it having given you a lot of money you can always product produce a best product if i give you more people than what you need you can always produce a product better than iphone or better than a mac or better than probably uh, a boeing aircraft for example or anything else that you can possibly see but the beauty or the the, the fun is in the fact that how do you use the resources optimally do you want to sell uh, a car at 20 lakhs or maybe to want to cross do you have a customer for two crores you may have but how many of them and do people really see value in buying something for two crores with only limited amount of features so putting all this together is a very interesting activity typically what also happens in today's world is as you work towards uh, uh, operations you also know how your production process works so moving on to marketing uh, i'll quickly uh, run through another few of them i think we are almost uh, close to the end of the presentation but so marketing talks about environmental analysis we talk about internal external environment we talk about markets cultures government regulations customer test very important you never know when a customer thinks this is useless uh, very interestingly uh, there is a very very powerful quote that i think uh, one of the gurus of marketing had said i think it's philip kotler is many times customers if they don't like they don't go and tell tell the manufacturer they don't go and tell the retailer they simply walk out into a new product or a new brand nine out of 10 customers will simply sell dispose switch on to another service or product so you don't know today in customer life cycle management you're trying to find out whether you know what the customer is doing after is what your product you're trying to keep in touch with him to see whether he's happy or not with it but traditionally what happens is in marketing it's very important to understand it's important to see whether marketing actually creates a need and and fundamentally the difference between marketing and sales i mean both are interchangeably used and i have also used it just for simplicity is marketing is creating the need it is trying to associate somebody's need with the product that you want to manufacture it is something that you want to bring in that value saying okay now you've married now you've got a family it is time to go for a car you see those ads campaigns promotions when you talk about compact car they say it's now time to move from 2 to 3 or 3 to 4 because your family is increased you can go for a compact car the difference between a two wheeler a good two wheeler today is from and to a, a small size car maybe a couple of lakhs that's it and there are ways and means to get it so marketing is all about creating the need marketing today happens in a very different way social marketing happens today facebook linkedin and twitter and so many other uh, media uh, social media platforms promote a lot of marketing and people because they are clued on to it they are constantly seeing it they are constantly actively involved in it they do influence uh, or get influenced by this marketing okay moving on further on to marketing in terms of planning and mix so of course it's important to know what so so before i move on am i audible clear any questions am i fast slow do i need to give you a little bit more example i am running out of time because i think uh, it's a very vast area that i have to cover and uh, possibly i don't want to run beyond a few minutes uh, from the scheduled time but any questions or any thoughts any views okay perfect let's quickly go on uh, so again going on to marketing mix is all about uh, how do you segment your customers how do you know who needs what how do you know who will probably buy what kind of activity uh, items what kind of products and uh, it's also about research about forecasting it's also about uh, understanding whether is the right time to invest it is the right time to diversify uh is it a right time to divest as well so you are in a particular line of business you need to know whether you are at the end of 
a product life cycle. So we'll talk about when we get into V1, the product life cycle. So there's a growth phase, there's a maturity phase, there's a decline phase. Typically what happens is that happens in everything. It, it happens in a system implementation. It happens in a marketing. It happens in many other areas where there is always different stages of growth and maturity. And for some reason, if things don't work, certain products go into decline and only to be regenerated or reinvented into a different line. So a good example, I would say, not that it was declined, but with the onslaught of so many other uh, automobiles in the in the country in India, you saw the flagship brand of Hyundai in the 90s, mid 90s. Somewhere they moved on from Santro to other areas. And if you see today, Santro is relaunched again. Now, same happened with uh, Maruti Suzuki or Suzuki uh, India Limited uh, a year back because they brought in their balloon again. Of all the Maruti brands, uh, I was a Maruti customer some time back. The Baleno was the most, the biggest failure. A brand did, we didn't last, last even a year. But the relaunched brand after almost 10 years is fairly successful. Now, I do not know what went behind the thought of going back for the same Baleno again. There must have been some reasons. There must have been some uh, logic behind why they want to relaunch a brand in the name of Baleno. They could have chosen any other name. Similarly happening for Santro. Santro was not bad. I mean, it was very successful. But there was a stage when there were other similar cars from other brands. And somewhere Santro got into other i10, i20 and so many other similar segment cars. So what I'm trying to say is that the need to divest, ram down or probably start in a different market. Good example is uh, Suzuki India. Suzuki is manufactured in India today. Lot of cars only to export to other parts of the world. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but the A-Star, which was not a very successful Suzuki brand, runs very good in African countries. It is one of the most successful brands in African countries. So we talked about this Ritz, A-Star, and then Wagonar and those cars in the mid-2000, late 2000. If you look at those cars, some of those cars didn't go well, but A-Star was relaunched in Africa as one of the I would say sedan type of a car. So it is very successful as well. So these two things happen because you never know what the customer was thinking at that point in time. The choices the customer had when A-Star was launched was very different in India because you had the likes of Renault, Nissan, Toyota and everybody else. You had the Etios, you had the Sunny. There's so many other cars in the five to eight lakh segment. There's somewhere people said, We've, it's enough with Maruti, Suzuki and Suzuki India now. Let's move on to something different. Maybe I'll bring in a Japanese technology. Maybe I'm seeing different difference in a German technology. Maybe I'm seeing something different from some other country. So customer tastes keep changing. So it's important to have constant planning and research the market. See what the customer thinks. Why is he looking at moving into a car? So different car, a different brand. A lot of companies today are trying to do buyback. They're saying you have a Maruti brand, give it to us. We have a different Maruti for you or a different Suzuki for you. You see that across all. Alto mode into Vegan or into something else and probably today into a different car like uh, Brezza and all that as people you know have uh, their uh, capability to buy expensive cars <laughs> moving on of course we talked about marketing from a b2b b2c we know how this works we know the requirement of a business is different versus a customer sometimes it's easy to work with businesses because you have a very clear direct interface you know what is not working but customers are spread across in many cases, you have a lot of channel marketeers or middlemen. You have uh, people who are uh, service centers, authorized distributors, sorry, distributors or dealers. Sometimes the information from the customer right up to the person who is making a decision in a manufacturing setup in a company is not that clear. Sometimes it gets lost in the transit. So there are different aspects to it. But again, customers are important as well from individuals because those customers are again people who are actually going to be promoters of your business. So if you sell to a business, you will get repeat orders. But from a brand perspective, how many of you know what kind of accessories are sold to Nokia or to Samsung or to Apple today from a manufacturer? It's between two businesses. End of the day, yeah, you will still know that there are five or ten companies which are famous in manufacturing certain accessories to a bigger brand like Nokia or maybe or uh, Samsung. But end of the day, the brand is not known. But if it goes to end customers, the brand value is there. And of course, 
marketing also happens on social grounds. Uh, I was very surprised to know a couple of years back when I did a study that as compared to what we normally think, the largest number of two wheelers sold in the country is in the villages. And these are primarily the Hero Honda and then the Hero Corporation after the uh, splitting of or uh, parting of ways between the Honda Corporation and the Hero Motors of India. So sometimes we feel that cities have the last uh, large number of two wheelers. But if you see the, the biggest sale for Honda, because that was the area where Honda felt that will go to Hero. And it, it indeed happened. Today, if you see a lot of two wheelers coming from the Hero Motor Corp stable for the villages, not the Honda comparatively. OK, moving on. Human resource, uh, an important function. Uh, typic typically, it's it's all about people. It's all about how people are brought in, how they contribute, how do they exhibit their skills, whether we have people in line with the roles that's supposed to play. Uh, organizations are also extremely uh, dependent on how people operate. So we talked about culture. We talked about capabilities and so on. But an organization is made up of people. Even if you're talking about virtual organizations, people here does not physically uh, mean physical people working in an office setup. So it's important to hire the right talent to make sure that people are adequately motivated, trained. Uh, there are different strategies in bringing in people. You know, today, I mean, 20 years back, if you are a fresher, you are a curse. You would never get a job. Possibly you will have to somehow go into a company that you may not like, spend at least a year or two to get some kind of a, what they call experience at those days, and then get into a, a decent or a reasonable organization. Today, the freshers or people coming fresh out of college or business schools are the most sought out of, sought after. Because the, the question is all about that experience that we are bringing in today, we were bringing in yesterday, can be uh, basically documented and brought into processes and procedures and can be trained to somebody who has no idea about how corporate life is. Today we have systems, training materials, training environments, videos, lectures, and so many SOPs or standard operating procedures to basically help people understand what needs to be done. And we don't need to rely on experience. Experience is useful in certain roles, in certain functions, at certain stages when decision making is important. But for the most part, it is not required. Similarly, there are a lot of change in strategy in terms of how workplaces, as I told you that there are certain companies where they today have a very different dress code. The way they start their work, the way they finish their work, there is a mandatory monthly party. Everybody has to attend. Every year they they get a partly sponsored, you know, abroad vacation trip. I mean, it's like there are different reasons why people want to work today. I think the reasons why you wanted to work a few years back was A, to have a career, B, to have a decent sum of money. But today, people want to work because they want to have a good time. They want to socialize. Of course, they want to build their career. They want to earn money. But the reasons why people get into an organization or a corporate life today is slightly different than how it was in the past. For people like us, so I have a large team of people. So for people like us, it is a constant challenge to understand what people really want. What I think they want and what they actually want sometimes can be very different. And we are constantly looking at, I would use the word upgrading, but it's not actually upgrading, but constantly looking at being up to date in terms of understanding their needs. It is no useful for them if they look up to me and say, you've got 20 years, you've done so many things, you have experience and fine. It's good. It's a starting point. But beyond that, as a leader, as a person with so many years of experience, what am I giving them? What am I giving to the team? What am I contributing? How can I keep them engaged? How can I build their careers? How can I help them understand what is required to grow in the company? So HR looks at all these areas. They are, uh, of course, the, there are routine processes of entry, exit, induction, and so on. Similarly, there are processes where there are appraisal reviews, there are training, there are competency assessment where somebody is assessed for whether they are scalable for the next role or for promotion in the future, and so many other things that uh, HR is responsible for. It's all the people dimension of it. But it is more than that. It is not about processes and procedures and policies. It is more than that. It is about whether they are able to bring in the potential people have, whether they are able to 
eliminate the barriers people have in terms of being creative being expressive whether there are concerns that they can help them address whether there are uh, areas that they can channelize them or give them directions on and so on so typically the role of each of the functions in a digitized world is also changing and that's where i think as you go through the materials as you go through the course you'll also see the lot of attempt has been put to make it very relevant today the examples that we are talking about or what you would read in a textbook also revolves around what you see today absolutely today and it's important for us when we do something like sema or aca aca acca is to see what is actually happening how close are, is what i'm reading to what is actually happening outside so which means that you need to constantly read about what's happening around us and strongly link it back to okay if i'm working i'm working for a company so is my hr function organized differently is my structure tall is my company into offshoring does my company focus on marketing what kind of products do we heavily promote and why not because the ceo likes it because that's where you get revenue and that's where customers are uh, looking at high demand as well so these are areas that as a company we need to keep looking at it as an employee because it becomes very easy for us when we relate things to what we study and somewhere i feel there's an area that you know sometimes we lack we are very theoretical we look at certain things but we ca- it's very simple that everything that we read and, and understand is very practical today thanks to the internet and the technology around us could i stop here uh, any questions any thoughts i'm sorry for running over a little bit but i, I guess it is uh, a little bit of interest on covering certain areas with examples that probably help some of you uh, any questions any thoughts any different opinion any disagreements any different views feel free to please let me know any query anybody has please communicate anything you want to know which was not discussed or any query please 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 communicate jack mayuri indranil sobit so i am hoping that uh, when i was talking you were listening to me yes new person yes any different views anything that you feel uh, that you you're not really convinced about or not clear about See one important thing that we all need to understand here is we are trying to link a theoretical or academic side to a practical side. So the session is to basically share experience of what we've seen that is basically that is read in the books. So there could be areas where certain things are looked at differently by you than the way we look at it. So always when you are in a class, feel 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 free to share your thoughts. so that we are able to understand uh, how relevant that that you are seeing all these topics to be ganesh your video is not coming sorry your video is not coming uh i do not know just a moment yeah okay can you see me now no one second one second yeah can't see Mm, i can see myself as or as normal not a problem i just want to say that ki we have second session tomorrow also in the morning at 10 am mm-hmm. and with that we can keep it slightly longer say 2 hour 10 to 11:30 we will have the session and then 11:30 to 12 o'clock whatever the student wants to say whatever they want to communicate because that will be fine for everybody so that you will be able to communicate in two classes whatever you want yeah now we can see you okay what's the point of view others mayuri jack radhishyam anil aisha rajan 
because we have the another session tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock which will be running till 11.30 then 11.30 to 12 o'clock we can have a doubt session for whatever queries we have is it okay all of with all of you yeah so not a problem thank you Ganesh for giving us your time and you can say I can say that when I was here I was totally hearing one and a half hour and I can say that it was a fantastic session correlating all the concepts with the practical examples because you have that expertise which we are using in the class so I was fully satisfied you can say whatever you were saying the most of the topics were revised and maybe those are not exactly relevant for you can say a strategic level student somebody will say but as a strategic level student there are three four students here you know that we are doing the pharmaceutical company all these concepts are relevant when we are writing our answer so I mean to say that maybe you are a CMA student or ACC or anybody it's hundred percent relevant in your syllabus and when you will understand these concepts you can score much more marks than what you can think at the same time the practical side also is also very relevant so thank you for you for giving your time and we will again take your time tomorrow and then whatever doubts we have we will be discussing between 11.30 to 12. Okay for everybody and Ganesh you? Perfect. Yeah. So we are leaving for today. We will be meeting tomorrow at 10. I will be giving you link all of you 